Hello, and thank you for lending your ears to RateHub.ca's Real Money Talk podcast. In this show, we give you the real talk on all things money. We eliminate the fine print, we junk the jargon, and we explain how you can make smarter financial decisions. We're not millionaires, we're thousandaires, and we know you are too, so this show is for you. We want to talk about money because it affects everyone, rich and poor. Money shouldn't only be the occupation of the 1%, but rather the 99%. Avocado toast ain't the reason you're broke. Don't hold out lattes for paydays. Let's make money in everyday discussion. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John, and today with me on the show, we have Andrew Hallam. Andrew, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, oh, thanks very much. First of all, for the invitation, I really appreciate the offer to, uh, to be on your show. Uh, introducing myself, I'm a school teacher, but I've been a personal finance writer in conjunction. So I've kind of had two careers running simultaneously. I started my career on Vancouver Island, teaching high school English. Um, and then I took a year off, like a deferred salary leave in 2002 to 2003, which is, wow, it's a long time ago now. But that was amazing because the school district was taking sort of uh, a percentage of my income every month. And then I was given a, a full year off, essentially with pay. So they pay it back to you on a monthly basis during your year off. And the idea is that at the end of whatever you want to do during that year, you can come back to your previous job. It'll be there. But I never came back. So I used it to travel. I intended on coming back, but I used it to travel for a year. And then the principal of the school that I was at got a job teaching at Singapore American School. So he became like the so a vice principal of the high school there, he sent me an email while I was in Morocco and said, uh, I know you're interested in travel. This is an awesome place. If you're interested, we can line you up with an interview. If you fly to Boston, meet the superintendent. And so I did that and I never went back to Canada. So I went to Singapore. I, I taught there uh, high school English and high school personal finance. It's uh, the largest single campus international school in the world. So it had 4,000 kids from K to 12, 54 different nationalities represented in the student body. It was just a super colorful place to live and then to launch uh, like travel excursions from. In 2014, um, my wife, who taught Spanish there, and I, and I met her there, she's an American, she said to me, uh, let, like, let's take a year off. So we thought, we'll, we'll do that. One year led to two, which led to three, which has led to eight. And so uh, right now I'm in uh, Panama City, Panama. We have a, a strong dislike for cold winters. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Living the life most of us could only dream of. And I will say, though, even though you left Canada, you know, we still get to benefit from your teachings. It comes in the force, form of your books now. Um, the most recent one being uh, Balance, which I'm looking forward to talking to you about. But before we get into that and into our discussion, so whether you're a longtime listener or first time um, listener, we always kick things off with a, a money mistake or makeup. And it's important to know even that millionaire teachers such as yourself can make mistakes or makeups uh, with their finances. So I'll go first. Um, the mistake that I made was uh, I bought a big box of cat litter. We buy it in bulk. And um, the mistake was the fact that my wife had already bought it. And so we ended up with two massive boxes. And we live in a house in Toronto. Anyone knows about housing in Toronto? They're not very big and storage space is uh, is is, is uh, scarce. So we'd rather not have two big bulk, uh, bags of um, kitty litter taking up our storage space. So one of them sits on the floor outside now. But um, yeah, that was my most recent money mistake, not checking in on my wife before I did some shopping. How about you, Andrew? Uh, you have a mistake or a makeup that you've done recently? Well, first of all, with the kitty litter, can you like, you know, scatter some of that on the sidewalk or something if there's snow? I mean, does it allow for grip? Is it that sort of thing? I, does, you I know, mean, does it have any, any other kind of purpose? I don't know. It's a great idea because on my shopping list is salt for my, uh, for my patio now, too. So uh, I'm going to have to do some research and see if I, I don't have to bake that purchase. And you just turned my mistake into a potential makeup. So I appreciate um, that. It could be totally bogus, too. The, the, only, the only thing that got me thinking about that was, you know, when I was in university and I was working at BC Transit, it was like a, I was a serviceman. So essentially what my job was, like the city buses would run their routes. They would bring them back into the big uh, big yard in Victoria. 
and then I would refuel these things and then take them through an automated bus wash and park them. So that was like my summer job. And what they did was when we spilled fuel, which, you know, invariably happens, mm -hmm. we spilled diesel fuel all over the place from time to time it happens because you're dealing with like hundreds of liters just rushing in and something's just not quite right. You end up with a bunch of diesel. They used kitty litter. Like they would, yeah. they would toss it on to the spilled fuel and it would like soak it up. So it was kind of a, yeah. Get, that's that's what got me really thinking about well maybe you know you could put it on the sidewalk or maybe everybody would hate you for that because then you'd have to sweep it up afterwards and it'd just make a mess and not have any uh any effectiveness at all i don't know yeah well, we'll only uh we'll have to find out though worth the research for me after this call for sure <laughs> so money mistake money mistake now can it be can it be something i did a long time ago that was really stupid sure yeah yeah, I mean, and in retrospect, like at the time, you know, it went from this idea that seems stupid in the beginning. And then I warmed up to the fact that it might not be stupid and then it might be brilliant, then believed it was brilliant. And as it turns out, it was totally stupid. So it was essentially, in the end, it was a Ponzi scheme. And a friend of mine was making 54% a year and he'd been making this money for several years. And there was this, it was actually, I'll even, I'll even name it. It was called Instacash Loans, essentially the company. So the idea, I mean, it had a good premise behind it. At least it sounded good, as they always do. You know, if you wanted to borrow money, kind of like a, a payday loan thing or whatever, you'd, you'd go in and you'd ask this guy, he'd say, hey, you know, can I, can I borrow three grand? And you would actually turn the ownership of your vehicle over to him. In the, and he wouldn't drive it. You'd still get to keep it. You'd still get to drive it. But if you couldn't pay off your loan and your loan had this crazy pawn broker's fee, like there's only so much official interest they can charge you, but they would they would sort of skirt that by charging this pawn fee. And uh, and I can actually just see like some of your listeners are like, hey, man, maybe this would be a good business to start. No, don't start it. Um, <laughs> and it sounded pretty good. Like, you know, you didn't pay off. They didn't pay off the loan. Uh, he could repossess the car because essentially it's in his name and then, you know, everything would be good. So a friend of mine had been doing this for years. Like I remember when he started and I said like, no, dude, you didn't make 54% after this one year because, you know, you just kind of received 54% of what you gave him. Right. So then year two came along and he says, no, Andrew, I got 54% again this year. And I said, well, no, you didn't really because you paid taxes on both years. And so you haven't even really got back what you gave him. And so, you know, I always assumed that the money could co just completely disappear. Well, then year three rolls around and year four rolls around. And eventually I'm starting to think, holy smokes, this is looking pretty darn amazing. And this guy was putting more and more money into this thing and he wasn't working. He was just using it to travel. And so I put some money in and no sooner did I do that, I think I received like two quote interest payments. This thing went for, I think this thing went John for about seven years wow. before it fully imploded. And I think I probably got two interest payments and then lost my $7,000. I actually wow. told the story in, uh, in Millionaire Teacher the book that I wrote and I wrote it in 2011 and then the second edition in 2017, but that was humbling. And it was a great lesson that if it looks too good to be true, it generally is, even if it has a quote, long track record. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, kind of like the, um, you mentioned in your book, uh, balance, what I, which I want to get into about how uh, a lot of companies out there advertise historical performance to indicate future performance, but often there isn't exactly that kind of correlation. So going back to it, you wrote The Millionaire Teacher, extremely popular book, and now your new book, Balance. What compelled you to write it? To me, it was, I think, several things. One was that I would meet people who would say things to me like, you know, Andrew, you know, you're globally you talk about money so one of my what my wife and i do now is we do a lot of traveling and i give a lot of finance talks around the world so just uh you know probably my busiest six month period was speaking in 
14 different countries and giving 90 talks during that six month period. So we've been pretty busy with giving all of these talks. Uh, and overall, I guess I've spoken in about 30 different countries. And people come to me and say, ah, oh, you really like money and you really like personal finance. And, and I keep saying, truthfully, money is just a tool. Like, I don't like money and I don't like personal finance. I like helping other people, but I don't necessarily like it myself. I use it as a tool. And so when I wrote the book, Balance, or what I really wanted to do is I wanted to look at why it was that we pursue like anything. Like, what is it that we want to get out of the things that we do? Like everything from, here's the irony. Uh, if you ask somebody like why they did anything, like why did you get a master's degree or why did you just go to the bathroom or why did you want to run that marathon? All of the answers will sound different at first until you continue to dig with why. And then eventually it will always boil down to some element of life satisfaction. I think it'll make me feel good, safe or secure, like pretty much everything, everything we do. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out, all right, what does the science say about life satisfaction? So life satisfaction is what equals success. Success isn't necessarily you know, having uh, a massive home on a hill and driving a Maserati and earning a million dollars a year, because if your relationships are train wrecks, then you're not going to be satisfied with life because relationships are, are huge with respect to how we actually feel. And so I wanted to write about money, but from a holistic, with a holistic, broad perspective. So I looked at four quadrants of success. And so, again, you could look at it as four quadrants uh, that are required for life satisfaction. And it, you kind of need all four. Like if, you, or if you're missing one, something isn't going to be right. So the four quadrants that I talked about in the book Balance were one, uh, having enough money. So we do need enough money. We need shelter. We need enough money for things like healthcare and good quality foods. We want to be able to spend some money on cool experiences and have some money that we can hopefully invest effectively for our future. So four quadrants, kind of like four legs of a table. And the second leg of the table is the relationship leg. Like it has to be solid. You have to have good relationships with other people. Otherwise, you're not even close to maximizing life satisfaction, no matter how much money you have. The third leg of that table was health. So we do need a degree of health. And there's so many things that we can't control that we need to really try to focus on the things that we can control because you have one body. And that body is your vessel for life. So do whatever it is that we can do to just try to at least maintain the health that we have or potentially make that a little bit better. And then that fourth table leg was a sense of purpose, what the Japanese call ikigai, you know, that reason to get up in the morning. So yeah, I wanted to write balance to look at the science of overall life satisfaction as it related to both spending money and investing money. Amazing. And I love how throughout the book, you you go into practical examples of what you could and cannot do with your money or should and shouldn't do with your money, some practical advice. And then you pull out consistently throughout the book to go back to those four quadrants and talk about that why and, and uh, that whole balance, as you mentioned, and as the book's titles, uh, with looking at it in relation to other aspects of your life as well. Um, do you have a favorite uh, chapter that you wrote? I would say no one's ever asked me that question, John. Let's try and think. I, I think the chapters dealing with research on material acquisitions as they relate to happiness. We all hear the term like, you know, you have to defer gratification if you want to build wealth. So it's as if, you know, you're you're denying yourself some kind of pleasure now so that you can invest money for the future to build your wealth. But the research suggests that that's not entirely true in that a lot of these things that people do 
to in, in pursuit of immediate gratification don't enhance our levels of happiness at all. So you can take something like, you know, purchasing a new car uh, or an expensive car. And when we look at research on that, based on something called uh, hedonic adaptability, we get used to whatever it is that we buy. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize in behavioral economics, and he defines happiness, or he categorizes it two ways. One was called reflective happiness, and the other is experiential happiness. And so mm -hmm. reflective happiness is like, John, if you had you know, a, a top of the line Maserati, and I asked you, hey, John, are you happier driving that than you were like a couple of years ago driving that 10-year-old Honda? You would say, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. And so this is what you think. You think this is what makes you happy or what makes you, made you happy. Mm -hmm. But when we look at, it's almost like um, our, our actual rationalization. It's a, it's a protective mechanism in one, in one respect to rationalize decisions that we made. But experiential happiness, it's actually what you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Michigan State University did a really interesting study on people that drove different levels of cars, high-end cars versus low-end cars. And they would ask these people repeatedly a series of questions, and obviously, as with any good research study, nobody really knew, you know, the participants didn't really know what the researchers were looking for. But one of those questions was like, rate your driving experience today. Like, how did it make you feel when you drove today? And they asked these questions over and over and over, a whole variety of different ones. And what they found was that people that drove high-end vehicles didn't enjoy their driving experience on a day-to-day -day basis anymore than people that drove low-end vehicles. And when we look at material acquisitions in general, I mean, the more materialistic we become, uh, to a point, the poorer we can end up being because we pursue certain things that we think will make us happy. But hedonic adaptability plays its role. And if we are borrowing money to buy these things that don't enhance our levels of happiness, in fact, they can even do the opposite getting you on like a treadmill of consumption, sort of like, like eating sugar all the time, uh, then this can lead to lower levels of life satisfaction. Therefore, are you really denying yourself pleasure by not buying a brand new car or not upgrading your phone or upgrading your, your watch or your purse or your clothing or whatever that may be? So I, I like to look at that. I mean, I, I love looking at that research and then looking at you know, when we do spend money, where does it enhance our life satisfaction? And obviously the idea that when we build memories, that's so much fun. Like if you and I were, you know, had been friends for years and we were hanging around a campfire, you and I aren't going to talk about the things that we purchased 10 years ago. We're going to talk about the fun and crazy and dumb stuff that we did because our actual experiences become parts of our identities. And those are the things that we want to keep and those are the things that we cherish so yeah i love digging into that research and then interspersing it throughout uh the book balance i loved it i loved uh the little anecdotes that you bring out throughout the book and i do particularly remember that uh that chapter you talked about cars and one of the one of the recommendations you gave about just being mindful and just going out there and having a drive to appreciate the thing that you purchased right and and uh I was going to say, it made me reflect on, you know, sometimes you see in those movies, you see like the ultra, ultra wealthy, like they're so rich, they can't even afford to drive their own car. They are not can't afford, but they don't have, afford time wise to drive their own car. So they have a chauffeur, like they probably spend a lot of money on that car. And all they do is sit in the back seat. They don't even get to enjoy it and, and drive it as well. Um, your book is full of a little anecdotes uh, like that about uh, stories of, of people you met throughout your travels uh, who are changing the way they think, right? I mean, you talk a lot, of, like you said, about uh, money being a uh, conduit uh, to get you to happiness, but it's not the driver of the happiness, right? Um, what would you say to someone who is kind of in the same position as um, Ashley was at the beginning of your book, where she, they're taking a uh, them having a realization, whether that's through the birth of a child, a, a, a new job, a move, but there's a triggering event that's making them realize that they need to do something 
to change. Um, and they're having some difficulty with the inertia, with that just, just doing it. With some advice, some practical advice to help people get over that hump. So one of the the simplest and I think most effective things people can do, and I think everybody should do this. So, you know, listeners right now, if you're not doing this thing today, or if you haven't been doing this thing, start start today. Like as soon as you, know, you stop listening to this podcast, get an app for your phone, like an expense tracking app, and track what you spend and what you make. A lot of people will say, uh, oh, I don't need to do that because my credit card tallies up everything and I pay for everything with a credit card. But that's not the same thing because it doesn't allow for you to categorize your expenses. And by manually entering them, you increase your level of accountability. So, for example, we just went, I just came back from the grocery store. I took the receipt. I entered groceries. I put $55, which was the, the bill, it was just a, a short little quick trip to the store. But in doing that, when you're categorizing it, you can see obviously where your income is coming from, but you can see more importantly where you're actually spending money. And you're able to then align your spending with your values because sometimes someone like Ashley then, for example, is going to look at how she's categorizing or where her money is going. And there will be things that literally hit her in the face. She'll look at certain expenses and be absolutely shocked that she's spending so much money on A, B, or C, when A, B, or C, even in her eyes, don't necessarily give her a huge bang for her contentment buck. And she has no idea that she's actually spending that much on those things. So it allows us to dial back our spending, which then allows us to redirect our money towards, in Ashley's case, it's paying off student loans, and or investing money for the future. It's a bit like a diets. I know Weight Watchers did an interesting study to see what, what was the single variable that most effectively allowed people to lose weight. And, and it wasn't diet and it wasn't exercise. It was tracking what they ate because you be, really become accountable for it when you have to manually enter it. And so you know you have to manually enter it and you, you know, you've stopped at Tim Hortons and you're like, should I go in there? I mean, I look at my expense tracker and I know that I'm going to have to expense this donut and the donut's not that good for me anyway, nor are the sugary muffins. You know, it just gives you pause, I think. And so this sort of thing I, I believe is really effective and that we all need to treat our households, our financial households, a little bit like a business, yet so few people do that. And yet if we did do that, um, I mean, obviously if businesses don't do that, they risk bankruptcy. And right. we risk, if we don't do that, um, at least being highly inefficient with our money. Yeah, that's that's some great advice. I, I wanted to add, if I may, one thing on the credit card statement comment was that a lot of times, actually, my father called me uh, up um, last week with this complaint. Um, he knows that I work in personal finance. He doesn't realize that I don't really make um, make the rules on credit card statements, but he, he wanted to vent anyways. And he said, how come it never matches the store you bought, right? It has some obscure name and sometimes it's tough to remember. So that's it. You don't get, actually get the level of detail you're looking for. I know me, I have a shared credit card with my wife. Sometimes I'm like, I don't recognize this store. What did we buy? Where did we buy? And sometimes it takes us some time to remember like, oh yeah, that's that's that thing we bought at that store We've and we just don't recognize the name. So that's another case against just relying on your, your credit card statements as well. Um, and going back, you know, Ashley was a great, it's a great opening story about, uh, about uh, this girl who decided she needed to do something to change. Um, one of the reservations a lot of people have when it comes to monitoring my spending is, uh, but then Andrew's going to tell me I can't buy Starbucks anymore. And then, you know, as a result, I won't be able to go out and meet my friends. So there's this anxiety around the impact it's going to have to my life, particularly in my social life for young people. Um, can you share some thoughts with our listeners on, um, again, advice or, or help put them into ease about the, the impact that this will have on their lives or the impact yeah. it won't have that they think it'll have? I, I'm so glad that you asked that question because when we're looking at, I mean, I always say life is like a dark hourglass. And it's as if you can't see it. It's tinted. 
and everyone is born with a certain amount of sand in it, but you don't know how much is in it. And so it gets tipped at birth. The idea that, you know, you have to live a certain way today so that potentially you can enjoy like retirement or financial freedom or financial independence at some point down the road is, is crazy. So that's why I really love looking at the science of essentially, if you're looking at frugality or you're looking at being responsible with money, looking at the science behind where can I spend my money in ways that will enhance life satisfaction and where is it truly a massive waste of money? So back to the coffee scenario, we are incredibly social beings, incredibly social. So when we go out for coffee, with friends, especially when we're going with friends, we're sitting down, we're enjoying, we're just, we're just enjoying this cafe, enjoying our friends, enjoying their company, hearing their stories. This is the essence of life. I mean, when you go to Europe, I mean, that's what's really cool. The whole concept of takeaway coffee in <laughs> most of Europe is totally foreign. Like they think it's crazy that anyone would have a coffee for, you know, a coffee on the run, a coffee to go. So, one of the reasons when we when we back up and we look at expensing something or spending something on, let's say like gourmet coffee, you, you, you stop at, I don't know, you stop at Starbucks and you do a drive through and you're on your way to work. No matter how much you love coffee, it doesn't have to be Starbucks. I know coffee connoisseurs are probably saying, well, Starbucks, well, that's not the best coffee. So, okay, if you're a coffee connoisseur, you've just picked up the best coffee to go and you're driving to work. While you're driving to work, you're not thinking about that coffee. You're not socializing with anyone. So it's not part of an experience. You're driving to work. And while you're doing that, you're thinking about the lights. You're thinking about that, that jogger who just ran by, who looks like he's, he or she's got like pink underwear on their head. Or you're going to think about your kids and whether I'm going to be late for, am I going to be able to, to make the soccer practice after work? And, you're thinking about all sorts of things. So your mind is not on the coffee. And so one of my chapters, the fifth chapter I have is, is called afford anything, but not everything. And the premise here is that, and I use this as an example, that coffee on the run like that, nice coffee, expensive coffee on the run, doesn't enhance your actual experience. And if you were to take the coffee at home, put it in a thermos and save, let's say $5 a day through that process. If you were like a daily coffee drinker and you invested that money, that literally could be a three quarter of a million dollar decision over your lifetime. And that's why I think what's, what's really, really important is to differentiate between what's actually going to give you satisfaction. The coffee on the run, according to science isn't, but the coffee with your friends, absolutely. Absolutely. Sitting down and enjoying their company while you're enjoying that coffee. So those aren't the things I'm recommending people cut back on at all. Yeah, that's it, it's great, too. I mean, again, you talk a lot about mindfulness, about being present. If you're going to spend money on a good cup of coffee, enjoy it. You know, be present with that coffee or, or it, like you said, it's a conduit. The coffee itself is a conduit to the happiness is, is actually the experience you're sharing with your your friends. Um, you 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 talk a little bit about i mean like i said you talk a lot about mindfulness and then at one point you mentioned the need and the recommendation for a gratitude journal do you have a gratitude journal i have had at different points in time so i'm one of these weird dudes who pretty much wakes up each day and each day is awesome and so i'm super fortunate for that it was funny cuz i was just listening to um a podcast with angela duckworth I think it was a Freakonomics podcast. And she was describing herself and certain people like that who just see the glasses half full. And, and that's me. And, and it's not that I haven't been through some crazy, crazy times, some painful times, you know, divorce. And uh, I end up getting cancer at one stage. But for me, I've been really lucky. But at times, I have written down the things that I really appreciate. And I've got a friend who actually is even more optimistic than I am, and he does it all the time. And so perhaps any of us, regardless of disposition, should probably consider that. And the research on it is really compelling. 
because with the gratitude journal, the idea of it is that you take one thing and you delve into it. So take one thing that you appreciate or a person that you appreciate or a circumstance that you appreciate. And once a week, I'll pick one thing and then write about it. And don't go listing a bunch of different things, but just write about why and how you appreciate that. And the research on that is interesting because it doesn't just boost your mood at that point in time. The research suggests that it has a long, prolonged effect. And you don't have to do gratitude journaling every day. In fact, it's a bit counterproductive to do that. But doing it once a week is enough. Okay. So what is one thing you are feeling particularly grateful for these days? I am grateful when I wake up. Um, <laughs> I just said to my wife as I gave her a hug, and and it seems like it's it's in jest, but it's not. I just said, her name is Pele, and I said, Pele, we both woke up again. And I know this sounds like such a silly thing, but it's not, because each and every one of us is going to be dead for a really long time. And like I'd say, like I said, nobody really knows when that end will come. So I think just appreciating the fact that we're still here um, is is definitely worth celebrating. The sun came up, but we're still here and we're healthy. So when you're healthy, never take that for granted because everything in life is temporary. Everything, your health, your very existence and the health and existence of the people around you too. And that's something that is so, so important. I mean, the idea of fighting with somebody and then walking away from them, knowing what could happen during the interim between when you la you know, you saw them and then when you see them next, uh, it's quite frightening as a concept that we could end up having a disagreement with a loved one and not resolve it and walk out the door because anything could happen to either one of us. And of course, the survivor is going to feel that heavily on their hearts. Awesome. You know, let's say I'm a bot. I bought in, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to buy the, the balance. I'm a lister. I'm going to buy the balance book. I want this life. Um, you did mention in that one quadrant, right? Which is, uh, which is still pretty important. Um, even if you buy into the whole gratitude and, and that material things do not necessarily lead to happiness, you still have to have enough money. And like I said, you, you do a great balance between going through the book and, and talking about some practical advice on, on how to manage your money as well. Um, chapter six opens. I love the title, by the way, Bathrooms and, and the Markets. Um, talks a lot about daily routines that uh, help you make your money. Um, what can you tell us about the difference between ETFs and, and mutual funds? Um, you know, because they're all basically, they're both ways to own a collection of, 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 of stocks, right? They're all, they're both you know, a collection of uh, an index, perhaps. Uh, what's the main difference between an ETF and a mutual fund or an active mutual fund? Yeah, yeah, it's good to preface that, suggesting that if it's an active mutual fund, an active fund manager is at the helm of that fund. And so they're using your money and the pool of monies of other people, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why they call it mutual, to buy and sell shares. So they're basically trading stocks. And they're hoping that through their clever stock picks and their trades, that it can increase the value of the fund, therefore increasing the profit levels for the people that are actually investing in those products. But the, the problem here is that there are fees associated with them. So a fund manager doesn't work for free. And so the fund manager has trading fees, internal trading fees that you don't see when they buy and sell. They can also make mistakes. Uh, they all make mistakes you know, in, in trying to find what they think might be a, a hot stock. And generally speaking, if you're looking at actively managed products, about 90% of them underperform their benchmark index fund, or you could say a benchmark ETF over a year, over a period of 10 years or longer. And so one thing people might say is, well, I would rather have an opportunity to be in the top 10%. So I'm going to buy an actively managed fund that has actually beaten the market index over the previous 10 years. But unfortunately, there's something known as reversion to the mean. It's what academics call reversion to the mean whereby a fund that does well during one time period often underperforms during another time period. So there's uh, Spiva 
publishes interesting data on this. It's called, if you want to look it up, the SPIVA Persistence Scorecard. So you can look that up online. What they do is they look at funds that were in the top quartile of performance during a designated period. And then they wait about two years and they see what percentage of those funds are still in the top quartile. And a very, very, very small percentage end up maintaining their winning ways. So buying mutual funds based on their historical track record is one of the silliest things an investor can do, but it's one of the most natural things based on reversion to the mean. So with an ETF, ETFs are something that you would buy. They can track an index. There are all kinds of different ETFs that are available now. Usually you pay a transaction fee and you would purchase them through a brokerage. But again, there is always that behavioral risk, which is huge, whether you're buying actively managed funds or whether you have a financial advisor doing that for you or whether you're buying your own ETFs. It's really natural for people to chase past performance. And so what you'll find is in 2012, for example, there weren't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of fanfare with respect to the U.S. stock market. Yet today, everyone loves the U.S. stock market. And so what it ended up happening was, you know, from the year 2000 to about 2013, in Canadian dollar terms, U.S. stock market didn't make any money, including reinvested dividends. And so it wasn't popular. There was a, there were so many Canadians at the time that were putting everything into just Canadian stocks. Then there was a reversion to the mean. So after that, U.S. market started performing really, really well, better than the Canadian market. So now we've gone another 10 years. And what you'll find is a lot of people with ETFs and with actively managed funds, they've got a really soft spot for the American market. So we're not... Um, we're not designed to invest. We're oddly primitive in that we like to chase past performance because it makes us feel good. And then we make up stories as to why it's a smart thing and why it will continue. One of the recommendations in, in my book, Balance, is to go with all-in-one portfolio ETFs wherever possible. So it's a one-stop shop and it makes it so, so simple. So if you want, for example, a portfolio that's diversified, which I think you should, because diversification really is the only free lunch. It helps to mitigate risk. Uh, to purchase something like a, a Vanguard or an iShares all-in-one portfolio ETF will give you exposure to the U.S. markets, Canadian markets, international developed markets, emerging stock markets, and potentially a bond market component as well if you choose one with a bond market component. And what the research suggests, and it's so, to me, fascinating, John, on this, it's that people who choose an all-in-one fund, and, and the Americans have had them for years, uh, target retirement funds, for example, Vanguard had them. And what the research suggests is that people in those funds aren't the sort of people that choose to chase past performance. They don't even think about past performance. They just say, oh, this is easy. I can own this one fund. And whenever I have money, I add money to it once a year. Uh, well, actually, it's constantly rebalanced. So it's internally rebalanced based on cash flow coming into it. So essentially, all that means is that the, the target allocation is maintained month after month. So you don't have to rebalance it. But what they find is that investors that purchase these products don't end up messing up. Whereas people that buy typical ETFs, individual ETFs or individual mutual funds typically underperform the posted performance of those funds by anywhere from 1.75% to 3% per year over a 10 year plus period. So that's devastating when it comes to yeah. long term opportunity costs. So yeah, my yeah. strong recommendation is as simple as it sounds, uh, you give yourself the highest statistical odds of success just by going with one of those all-in-one ETFs. I have a friend. He's a stock picker or tries to be, I should say. Um, he's, he did everything from the uh, jumped on the AMC bandwagon to crypto and, and all you can, trying to make that quick buck. Um, I don't want to – I have no idea about what his portfolio is and what mine looks like. I do all index investing, like you said, uh, all-in-one – most of them all-in-one ETFs. And um, like I said, I don't know about results, but I can tell you one thing. When we get together – 
I don't talk about things and it doesn't weigh on my mind nearly as much as it does with him. He brings it up every single time. And that, again, going back to that whole balance of, uh, you know, making money, but also just the happiness that comes with it. Um, so that's one thing. Portfolio, again, portfolio results aside, it just weighs on my mind a significantly a lot less than it does on, on his, this particular friend. Um, speaking of risky investments, do you invest in cryptocurrency? I don't. And, and here's why. For me, it, it doesn't have cash flow and it doesn't have a measurable intrinsic value. So I will invest in, if I invest in properties, for example, I know that it has a cash flow component because I can rent out my property and I'll receive revenue from the renter and I can increase rents over time to match inflation. So that's, that's what I will call an investment. Likewise, if I invest in, let's say individual shares or an ETF, the underlying entities are corporate, they're businesses, they're businesses that generate cash flow. And on aggregate, if you were to take, let's just say all of the companies on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and you were to look at their actual business earnings uh, as a group, their business earnings consistently rise over time, far more consistently than the stock market itself. The stock market itself will have some up years and some down years. Business earnings too will have up and down years, but generally speaking, it's, it's, a, it's quite a consistent upward move whereby pretty much every three year chunk, the average corporate earnings are higher uh, than they were the previous three years. And so, that's what I call an investment. And of course, the share prices will rise in line long term with corporate growth plus dividends. For me, a cryptocurrency has no intrinsic value. Um, it's like a, an electronic money order. And I know a lot of young people are going to listen to this and go, oh, he's totally crazy. Um, and, and maybe I am crazy. But uh, for me, I wouldn't invest anything in a cryptocurrency that I personally couldn't afford to lose completely. There's definitely. Um... Trends, especially with younger people, cryptocurrency, AMC bandwagon. But one of the other trends that we're seeing a lot lately um, is SRI becoming more and more of a hot topic. Um, I think it's your last chapter or sorry, no, towards the end of the book, uh, the happy, happy planet, happy people. You focus a lot on uh, socially responsible investing and, you know, our generation's desire to have a, uh, an improve the ecological footprint that we're leaving behind. Um, first of all, can you just explain a little bit for the listeners, those who may not know what uh, SRI uh, funds are? Yeah. So imagine a traditional index fund. Let's just take the S&P 500, for example. And then imagine that it were screened. So companies were taken out of it that had, let's say, a high carbon footprints. So Oil and gas companies, for example, would be eliminated from that index. So socially responsible funds would be those that would be putting a little bit more of an emphasis on companies that had more um, better environmental practices. They could be better social work related practices, or they could just be in industries that are less controversial. So, for example, a lot of it, most SRI funds won't have a high percentage of, if at all, gambling stocks, casinos and such. There's that addictive quality to them. Um, cigarette manufacturers and the like. Weapons manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that when you are investing in one of the, the, the things that people get a bit confused by is they say, well, I don't want to help an oil company by owning ExxonMobil or by owning an index that has ExxonMobil in it. You're actually not helping them. They, they don't, they don't, they're not able to extract more black icky stuff because you're a passive owner of their shares. They don't use your money for that purpose unless you buy a bond from them or unless it's like, a, and we're looking at you as a venture capitalist buying something really small and actually supporting that business. So you're just a passive shareholder. But are you sleeping well at night knowing that a lot of your money is coming from extraction of and use of say, high companies that are harmful to the environment. And that's where SRI funds come into play in that if you aren't comfortable with that and if you are deciding that you just 
want to, to the best of your ability, really profit from companies that are more ecologically sound. SRI funds are a really nice option. What ends up happening is this, like how do you support SRI firms, the actual firms, is use their products and not the products of others. So, you know, you've got a big diesel truck and you're super environmental and so you have an SRI fund. Well, no, because every time you pour diesel into your truck, you're wrecking the environment. I mean, I'm being kind of hardcore because it has right. implications, so I don't want to be like super judgmental because that's, that's actually not fair, but you want to use it sparingly. No matter what kind of vehicle you have, whether it's electric or otherwise, the idea is to use it sparingly. But one of the, the cool things is thinking that if more and more people, John, start thinking like this and they start putting their money where their values are, and I'm not talking about like spending money for an SRI fund or investing in an SRI fund, I'm thinking of actually using goods and services and avoiding goods and services, of course, that aren't ecologically sound and encouraging uh, or giving your money to goods and services that are ecologically sound. You know, spending in a certain type of store, buying certain types of products that are better for the environment. In doing that, we end up bolstering the profits of those greener companies. As a result of boosting their profits, the business profits are aligned long-term with share prices. And so then with an SRI fund, potentially, potentially here, an SRI index could long-term be the traditional index fund for that very reason if you know, we start putting our money where our values are. Amazing. It uh, That reminds me of the... Uh... Brown and Kasser study you mentioned where the high school students who are more ecologically responsible tend to rank even higher on happiness as well. So just the act of behaving in an ecological way, not just investing in an ecological way, has an impact to your ha happiness. Vice versa, it, it doesn't necessarily. And on top of that, doesn't really make the impact to the environment that you think it would as well. Um, I We are run out of time, and I have only chance for uh, one more question, and I didn't want to uh, end without asking, um, because it's all related to this whole, the environment and, and feeling of happiness. Why do you think Costa Rica is such a happy country? I know you loved it in your book. You, 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 uh, the love for that country comes out really strong in that chapter, and could you just summarize for the readers why you feel that way? I think in... In Latino families, period, or Latino cultures, period, family is is first and foremost. Uh, community is really, really important. So if you have friends who are Latino, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Or if you've spent time in, uh, in Central America or South America, you'll know what I'm talking about. So there's that element where people are happiest and end up having, well, generally had higher life satisfaction when they have good relationships with family members. And they're, they're really culturally encouraging uh, with each other. They're very open. It's a, it's a huggy culture. Um, often you get multiple generations living in the same home or really, really in close proximity to each other. But there's another element, too, with Costa Rica, and it's the level of safety. I mean, they haven't had armed forces there since the 1940s. They do not have an army. And so... Crime outside of the major city uh, isn't particularly high, so it's relatively safe. In San Jose, it's like any big city. Uh, there are uh, pieces of you know, sections that or areas that aren't as uh, aren't as safe. Um, but generally speaking, it's a pretty safe place, and they're not as material. And so research suggesting that material acquisitions don't enhance our life satisfaction at all. In fact, it can be the opposite when we pursue things and Costa Ricans don't tend to have that as their major emphasis. So it's more about family uh, than it is really about stuff. So I hope it always maintains that they, they have a an expression, Pura Vida. They say it all, all the time. It just, it means everything from hello to goodbye to how are you? Pura Vida. Uh, they have a high emphasis on the environment as well. And their leaders have a high emphasis on the environment. Costa Rica in itself is, is, is very clean. Outside of the major city of San Jose, it's as clean as any rural area of Canada. You've got all these signs that say, you know, garbage doesn't go away on its own. And if you've been traveling in sort of emerging market countries, you'll realize how rare that is. That's really rare, but they take great pride in their environment. They take great pride in recycling. 
And much like we were just talking about, John, when you mentioned the research on levels of life satisfaction relating to how we treat our natural environment and how we treat the people around us, I mean, it's all interconnected. And I think that's probably a main reason. Those are main reasons why Costa Ricans tend to be a pretty happy people. Great. Well, I, uh, I highly recommend reading the book so you can find out a lot more about why Costa Rica is such a happy country and some other amazing tips by uh, Andrew on how to live a more balanced and, and happy life for sure. And if you ever do go to Costa Rica, like I have, um, I do recommend here's here's a good good. Uh, thing to spend your money on experiences. They have the uh, what they call the Superman zip line in Monteverde, and it is exhilarating. One of the funniest funnest things I've ever done with my wife. So highly recommend it. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for sharing a little bit more um, about your experience writing Balance, the motivations behind it, and some of the lessons you can learn from it. Of course, we just scratched the surface here in that podcast, and I hope a lot of our listeners will buy your book and 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 feel grateful and present in, in the moment while they're reading it. Um, just wanted to end the show. Um, we do a little bit of a rapid fire. So I'm just going to ask you some really quick questions and you just give the answer that pops into your head. Um, so first question is, what's in your wallet? 15 US dollars. No credit cards or, or anything like that? Yeah, I have a, a DBS. Visa card and a Chase Sapphire Visa card and uh, an ATM card from a bank in Singapore and an ATM card for a bank in Panama. Amazing. Um, apart from balance or millionaire teacher or uh, any of the other books uh, that you've written, uh, the Global Expatriates Guide to Investing, Millionaire Expat, there's a, there's a few of them. What is one book that you recommend? And it doesn't have to be personal finance related, but what's one book you recommend everyone should read? Mm -hmm. You know, probably one of the most popular books in the world, and it's, it's popular for a reason, is Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And so How to Win Friends and Influence People for the Digital Age, many people think it's about... Uh, influencing others it's a book for salespeople, but it's really a book about relationships and every time i go back and read it i'm reminded of the things that i need to do a little bit better and so with respect to like listen far far more than you talk because you'll build trust and we don't learn anything while we're talking. Amazing. Love that book. Um, what was your first job and what did you learn from it? I worked at a supermarket and I think one of the things I learned is that I didn't want to work full time at a supermarket for the rest of my life. Amazing. <laughs> it's good. It's good. You learned that and had that experience early. Um, what is a commonly held belief about your industry or profession or space that you passionately disagree with? The idea that we should pursue early retirement. And so this is going to come as a shock to some of the listeners because like so many other people, I really believe that retiring early was awesome. And, and the idea that I need to set goals so that I could become financially independent at a really young age. And then as I, as I began to learn more about life satisfaction and human longevity, I learned that on aggregate, the people who retire earlier end up dying earlier. When we talk about that table that I referenced, the four quadrants of success or the, the four table elements of success, one of the components was a strong sense of purpose or a strong sense of what the Japanese call ikigai. And that's really, really essential for our life satisfaction. So I think in knowing that you don't have to have some kind of magic financial number is alleviates a lot of stress, number one, for people. Because if you decide to just dial back at a given age, like you've done well with your the building of your wealth and you decide that 
you're no longer going to work full time, maybe you'll work part time, but you're continually engaged. You're still working. You're still meeting new people in the work process. Um, research suggests that this sort of thing wards off more effectively things like Alzheimer's and dementia far more so than the idea of retiring early. And it gives you some kind of financial comfort knowing that you'll be able to earn money as long as you can. So you don't necessarily have to reach some financial or feel stressed to reach some sort of financial independence number. And so the magazine articles that say like, do you still need a million dollars to retire or how much do you need to retire? Uh, I think that's really wrong headed. It's not looking at the whole process uh, holistically, effectively, and with respect to life satisfaction and longevity. Right. Um, thanks for sharing that. If you had uh, one tweet uh, that everyone in the world would read or, um, you know, a billboard on the side of the highway um, that everyone would, you know, drive by and, and you get a certain amount of space, short space to say a piece of advice, what would you have written on there? What would you tweet about? Treat everyone with dignity and recognize that you can never really know what someone's going through unless you walk in their shoes. Is that too long a tweet? That's not too long in the tweet. We'll <laughs> we'll uh we'll give you extra characters if we have to. <laughs> um I'm assuming I know the answer to this question, but what's your number? You know, to walk away from it at all and live financially independent and never worry about money again. Do you have a number that, you know, came to you, you would say, all right, I'm done. Uh, for, well, for me, especially not just because I know that, I mean, I can continue to work and it's important to continue to work, to do things, whether you do it part-time or what, but also there's that flexibility as someone that travels so much. I realize that how much someone figures that they need if they retire in Toronto, is entirely different to what someone might need if they decide that they want to be a little bit more flexible and sacrifice Canadian winters to spend uh, five months in Costa Rica or Panama or Guatemala or Thailand. So, yeah, so I don't necessarily believe in those concrete numbers. And so as a result of that, I, I don't really have one. So, so what I thought you... That's what I thought you would say. And don't let this glaring sun uh, fool you. It is minus 18 outside right now. And I think with the min wind chill, minus 30. Um, so don't rush back to Canada and anytime uh, soon. Uh, hopefully when it's a little bit warmer, we can welcome you back. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what, is, uh, what is something that you want to be uh, known for when you die? Be a good person. Be someone who Amazing. Lives, uh, someone who cares. Amazing. Last question for you, Andrew. Where can people find you if they have any questions? They can contact me through my website at andrewhallam.com. Amazing. Um, so thanks again, Andrew Hallam, uh, his new book, Balance. And we really appreciate learning from you today, Andrew. And thanks for sharing more about balance in your life. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much, John. It was, it was a pleasure to meet you. I really enjoyed this. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Beat Chemist for providing us with our music. Find him on SoundCloud. I want to sincerely thank you, the listener, for taking the time out of your own day and investing it in yourself to get smarter about money. Head over to ratehub.ca to learn more about making smarter financial decisions. If you want to thank us, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify. Thank you for listening. Let's help Canadians choose better with their finances. And now for the fine print. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their parents in the program is not implying endorsement of them or any entity they represent. The views and opinions expressed by Rate Hub employees are those of the employees and do not necessarily reflect the views of Rate Hub Inc. or any of its sponsors or officials. This is for general use, not certified or licensed advisors. Yeah, we just don't want to get sued. <laughs>